Hello everybody and welcome to episode 19. Today we're going to be starting to cover this, moving from one room to the other. As you can see we're starting it off really quite simple. We've got this uh, zone that you can see behind behind the game I've placed in uh, our village, our first room, and when we step into it, it takes the player to uh, another room that I've created. And if we step back, it brings us back to that room, notably uh, informing the game where the player should spawn when we move from one room to the next, because if I restart the game, you see this is where I spawn, this is where the player is placed uh, in the game room. But the way we're going to set this up is uh, when we collide with the zone, it will tell us not only what room we need to go to, um, but where exactly the player needs to be stood and what direction they need to be facing when they get there. One little um, bug fix from previous episodes before we get started is um, you might notice just watching this footage, um, you might have to zoom in a bit, but um, these fragments as the camera moves you'll notice they sometimes seem a bit out of sync with everything else, um, they seem to like jitter around a little bit. And uh, that's because you might recall all of our entities and our player, etc., draw at a rounded position to prevent any kind of weird subpixel stuff, okay? Um, and we forgot to do that with our fragments, okay? So if you want to fix that, um, it, th this wasn't evident before because we had a room that was too small to really see the camera moving. Um, but it, it's a lot clearer now. So if you want to go ahead and fix that, you can just come into O Fragments Draw event and just wrap the x and y part of this uh, in a floor statement. Okay, simple as that and that will um, uh, synchronize uh, the, the, the movements of these fragments with the camera and everything else on screen. Okay, so off camera I've gone ahead and made a new room for the game. Uh, this is called R River. Um, very similar in setup, in fact exactly the same setup as um, our village, uh, using the exact same layer structure, just another child of our parent, built in the same way, it's just a bit bigger, okay, it's 320 uh, by 640, this representing um, it, it kind of just another leg in our character's journey, so we'll be in the village, we'll get a, a quest from this guy to go and get uh, rescue his hat from a cave, We'll, we'll journey up this river, maybe fight some slimes along the way. Um, we're going to have a boulder in front of the, the cave entrance that you have to blow up and get inside. Get inside the cave, get the guy's hat back, you win. Okay, that's the that's the general flow of our game. Um, and that's what this room is about. Um, I built it off camera because, you know, you didn't really need to see me just setting up all the tiles and stuff again. You can design whatever levels you want. Um, I mean, this isn't really perfect. I haven't really even accounted for the fact that you can just kind of walk off the, the, the side of the room here. <laughs> um, I'm, but I'm not here to do your level design for you. I'm just here to show you how to make stuff. Um, so I, I, I've made this room. Uh, the, the whole point is you're going to want a second room for this tutorial of some kind. Make sure your player is in it somewhere. Um, uh, I've just put them down here, um, it, but it doesn't actually matter where you place them exactly in the game world. So the first thing we want to do for this is make some global variables. Okay, so I'm going to come into O game, uh, our persistent object that exists from the very start of the game, uh, right through the end of the game, um, which is generally our go-to place in this particular project for making new global variables. We've got in our create event, initialize and globals, right? This is where we make them. The reason we want some global variables for this is we want to create some variables that are going to persist from room to room uh, that can tell us where the player is supposed to spawn, right, when we come from one room to another, uh, based on, you know, whatever triggered that transition, um, where should we put the player and what direction should they face, okay? So we're going to need four new global variables. I'm going to arrive global dot target room, um, which can just equal minus one for now. Global dot target x, uh, also minus one. Global target y, and global dot target direction, um, which can just equal zero. Okay, with those globals in place, we're going to make a new object. Um, so let's. It's getting a bit claustrophobic. Let's um, make a new workspace, close all but this, just uh, give ourselves some space and create a new object. I'm going to call this object O oh, room exit. 
And this object is going to function as a trigger area that we can place in our game, though when the player collides with it, it will send us from one room to another and inform uh, our global variables, our target X, target Y, and so on, um, where the player should spawn when we enter that room, okay? In order for that to work, we need to make some variable definitions so that we can alter those properties, the target X, target Y, and so on, on a per instance basis when we place instances of this object, okay? So in variable definitions, I'm gonna add a target X, a target Y, and target room. Those are the only ones we need. You might remember we also have target direction, but we're just gonna base that on whatever direction the player happens to be facing when we walk into this trigger. Okay, you, you could add that as one on here if you wanted to as well. And be like, if a target direction is set, you know, if it's not um, undefined or whatever, um, and then use that instead. I will, I'll leave that decision up to you as a way to sort of enhance the uh, versatility and usefulness of these triggers if you want to. That can be your own homework. Um, but we're just gonna stick with modifying these three and using the direction of the player. Okay, now in order for this object to function as a trigger area, it needs to have an area to be collided with, right? And for that, we kind of need to give it a sprite that it can use as a collision mask. So I'm going to go to sprites. We're going to make a new sprite and just call it S trigger. And I'm going to quickly edit together an image that's just going to be on like a, a blue square with some transparency. Um, Let's grab a blue, set the alpha a bit lower, just so that we can see through it when we place it in the world, um, and that will do top left origin absolutely fine for this. Um, then let's come back to our uh, O room exit, set the sprite to VS trigger, okay? Now we're gonna add the step event. What would also work for this is the, um, you know, the collision event, like a collision with the player. Um, I prefer in these kind of situations to use the step event. It's really kind of the same thing because um, we're just going to check to see if we're colliding with the player in the step event. And by using the step event, we just maintain just that little bit more flexibility and control if we want to kind of change how things work um, rather than just an event that, you know, triggers once when, when uh, the player touches uh, the instance. So in this step event, we're going to check to see um, if the player has collided with this instance, and if it has, we're going to cause a room transition. All right, the first thing we want to do is check to see if the player even exists. We're going to do if instance exists of oh, player, always a healthy thing to do before we start, you know, referring to an instance's uh, variables and so on, is check to see if an instance of that thing even exists. Um, just a handy little safety check. And assuming it does, let's get that other bracket in there, let's not forget that. Um, assuming it does, then we want to check if also position meeting o player dot x o player dot y um, id close bracket close bracket. So I don't know if I've already been through how if shortcutting works, um, which is on by default in GameMix Studio 2. If uh, if I write an if statement that has two conditions in it um, with an and like this, um, it checks the conditions in order, right? Um, and since um, the way the logic of an and works is it requires both conditions to be true, we know if the first condition is false, it doesn't matter what the second condition is, right? Because we needed them both to be true. Um, so what GameMaker does, and what you know, many languages do, is if um, if this does turn out to be false, it won't bother even checking this, okay? Which is what allows this to function as a handy check to make sure that the player is there before we refer to variables that might otherwise not exist, okay? So we won't do this check um, unless there is definitely a player. All right, so that's part of why we do it like that. So if there is a player and uh, the position of, you know, it's the player's X and the player's Y um, is in a position that collides with this particular instance, okay, ID being the ID of our whatever room exit is running this code. Uh, 
So if that's true, then we know we need to change rooms, right? So then all we have to do is replace what's ever currently in our globals with whatever is uh, in this particular instance. So global dot target room is going to equal target room, the local variable. Global target x is going to equal our local target x. And the same for target y. And then last of all, global dot target direction is going to equal o player dot direction. And remember, we've already confirmed that o player does exist. Okay. Now later, this will be where we start calling the code to um, or calling a function that will run a fancier room transition. We're going to do like a little slide transition just just to show you how it works. Um, but for now, we're keeping things simple and we're just going to snap straight from one room to the next. So I'm going to do room, go to target room. Just to be safe, to make sure we don't um, call all this a bunch of times, which is important when it comes to um, when we're doing our transitions and stuff like that, because, you know, this will be running every frame that we're actually sitting on the player. Uh, we're going to do instance destroy doesn't really matter for the time being because when we do room go to like this instance will get destroyed anyway um but as i said eventually this is going to be replaced with you know um uh, a function like do a tr do a room transition right which will take more than one frame to complete so we want to destroy the instance at the end of this to make sure that this room transition stuff isn't triggering every frame that the player is colliding with it all right so that already actually sets us up to move from one room to the next. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and just put um, these into the room where we want them. So in our village, I'm just going to put one. Let's put the grid on and really instances there. Yeah, and just plonk this at the edge here. Just resize it to be I don't know, whatever we want, just sort of off the edge of the screen there. Um, we'll bring it on a bit as well, actually, just so it's really nice and clear. Move this signpost out of the way. Um, you might want to prefer it so it's like you have to actually walk off the screen. You know, I'm, I'm going to leave all that sort of stuff to you. Um, but just for the clarity in the tutorial, we're just going to bring it right here. And double click on it, go to variables, and we can set up our target X, target Y, and target room. Uh, just click the little pencils next to these to be able to edit these values. And the target room is going to be our river. Now, for finding the exact uh, X and Y that you want to use, um, you want to go to that room, and the easiest way is to just place uh, your player, just because it doesn't matter where your player is in any one of these rooms, because they're always going to come into here via like a room exit, right? Um, you can just move them around and just use them as a dummy to place them exactly where you you know you think the player should actually um, appear when they they move from one room to the next just then double click them and just see what the X and Y is in, in that position and, and then you can put it back wherever it was you know you can just move them around like that so um, 24 5 2 8 appears to be a good place for this one uh, so let's come back and put 24 5 2 8 into there okay so now we're gonna do the same thing um, in our river so in the river map, let's, uh, now we can just move, move this player out of the way and put a room exit instance onto the layer, drag it out um, to wherever we want it to be, double click it, bring up the variables. Okay, um, let's close this down so it's not in our way. Um, so the target room, as we know, will be our uh, village. And then we can use the same method we used for the other room to find out our target X and target Y. Okay, so I'm going to pop back over to our village. And on the instances layer, drag in O player and just stick him um, anywhere. Like, I didn't want to move this one because that's where we actually want to, like, spawn. This is our first room of the game. Um, so I'm just going to drag in another one temporarily uh, just to find an X and Y position. I'm not putting him, importantly on the trigger area itself because you'll if you end up you know if you teleport onto the trigger area you'll just you'll get stuck in an infinite loop doing that right um which we will uh show you how to avoid um when we come to doing the 
fancier transitions. Um, for now, we're just keeping things simple. So just just don't use a coordinate that touches uh, the the trigger itself right now. Okay. Um, so for now, are we have x two nine six and y one one two. Okay. So if I pop back over to R River, uh, edit these. Target x is two nine six and target y. Uh, is 112. All right, and don't forget, of course, once you've done that, to uh, get rid of this temporary player. We don't want multiple player objects uh, in the game at once. All right, if I run the game now, I just want to show you. I mean, obviously, we haven't quite finished setting this up, but uh, and <laughs> we need to make this invisible as well. We just have this big blue trigger area, but the room go to part will work. All right, so the most basic element of this is I walk into here. And it's brought us through into the next room, but there's a couple of problems, right? Our camera starts way up, like near the top of the room, um, and we're not actually being positioned at that those coordinates that we set, okay? And if I come back in, it's yeah, I'm, I'm here where I would originally start, and that's the that's the issue we're trying to solve, right? That's why just a simple room go to doesn't really work here, and we need these global variables. Now, since we've set up those global variables via room exit, we know that when we come into a room, um, what where we want the player to stand and uh, what direction we want them to face, we just have to actually apply it. So I'm going to go into out player and go into the create event, just the you know all the stuff that happens when uh, a player object is actually created. And at the bottom here, um, what I'm gonna do is, if those global variables have been set to something, we will set our X and Y appropriately. So I'm gonna do if global.targetX does not equal uh, minus one, because that's our default setting, and it's also a setting we will never actually want to use for target x, right? Uh, so we know if it is minus one, we have we just haven't set anything to it. There's no reason we would set minus one as that coordinate, okay? And um, I think it's reasonable as well to therefore assume that if target x is minus one, then we probably haven't also set target y, right? It's, it's, I can't think of a reason why we would only ever set one of them. <laughs> Um, so it, it, as long as target X is minus one, then we can assume target Y is minus one as well. And then we can just leave the player wherever they are naturally spawning, right? Because we can assume this is just the first room and we haven't come here from any kind of transition. And this helps us as well if we ever want to do that in future after a cutscene or something like that, we can just set global target X to be minus one uh, or, and target Y to be minus one, reset those values, and then the player will just spawn wherever the instance happens to be, wherever it was placed in the room editor, right? But if it's not minus one, then we know that we have a position that we actually want to be in, okay? So I'm going to set x to equal global.targetx, uh, y equals global.targety, and last of all, direction equals tar uh, global.targetdirection. Uh, let's get rid of that random line of white space there. And um, the other thing was the camera, right? Um, so if I come into O oh, camera, what I'm going to do in here, um, uh, since the camera is persistent, its create event isn't going to run uh, every single uh, time we move from room to room, okay? It, it, it gets made once at the start of the game, and we don't actually... Um, run this create event like multiple times, okay? So we can't use the create event, and we actually kind of don't want to anyway, because then um, we, we we want the player to have moved first so that the camera can catch up to wherever the player happens to be. I, I mean, I suppose in theory we could just use those same global variables, but it's quite handy just being able to follow the player. Um, so what I'm going to do in our camera is we're going to add um, a, an event I don't know if we've used in this yet, um, which is in the other section, uh, an event called room start. Actually, I think we have. I think we've used it in an O game for la yeah layer management stuff. Yeah. So room start, just as a reminder, runs at the start of at the start of the room. Notably, after all the instances in the room have been created and therefore have triggered their create events. Okay. So the player's create event has gone off. Um, we've set ourselves to our appropriate position, so now we can just position the camera wherever the player happens to actually be, assuming there is one. Um, so my description here is going to be to update to player's new position. And we're going to do if instance exists, oh player, 
x equal o player dot x, y equals o player dot y. I mean, you might want to replace this with like uh, the follow uh, variable, um, if that's what it was called. Yeah, the, the follow variable, since you know the camera is kind of dynamic and can follow multiple different things, um, which might give you some more flexibility with things like cutscenes and something like that. This is just a quick um, solution because we're generally assuming that the camera is always going to want to follow the player whenever we move uh, from room to room. But I don't know, maybe setting this to, to um, follow.x and checking if that instance exists and so on is is worth doing as well. But bear in mind that if um, if follow contained o player's ID, uh, like the specific um, instance ID of o player from a particular room, then that instance ID will not necessarily be the same when you move to another room, okay? Because it'll be a new instance of o player that you're working with. So for now, for simplicity, we're just using o player there. Okay, so with that done, I can now run this and we can see the improvements that we've made to this uh, run through here. You can see we spawn in the correct place facing the correct direction and the camera is already in the right place. Um, last thing here, let's just go to room exit and mark this not visible. Okay, that's kind of important. Um, and there we go, that's, that's, uh, that's more the sort of desired effect, all right? Okay, and, ju and just to show it's keeping the direction as well, like if I kind of cheekily come in from above here, you can see it's, you know, it's maintained the, the down direction there. Um, only possible because of my kind of r rubbish, not very well thought through level design here. But <laughs> just, just to demonstrate that it does, it does work in that way. So that is moving from room to room. Um, as I said, we're going to put in a fancier transition here, but this honestly has kind of a charm to it in and of itself. Um, when I first made this code, I you know I wrote the transition in straight away, um, like there's a little sliding transition that sort of you know uh, uh, slides to black and then slides uh, fades back in just to, to show you the new room. Um, but honestly, this sort of snapping thing has kind of a charm. It feels instantaneous. It feels like that you know, you know that this screen really is physically right next to the next screen. So I don't know, maybe you might like this kind of transition and just kind of leave it like that. I'll leave that decision up to you, but next episode we will be covering how to make this a bit fancier, okay? One other thing to of course note is there's gonna be a lack of persistence when you move between these rooms. If I cut these plants and I go into here and I come back, the plants aren't cut anymore. All right, um, that's pretty standard as, as games go, right? You know, having things like that respawn in between room transition, um, keeping everything utterly persistent uh, between rooms is um, gonna make a headache for you and a lot of work. So I think it's generally better to pick and choose your battles when it comes to that kind of thing and decide exactly which things um, are important for you to keep persistent and you know a much later episodes will deal with persistence and things like um, uh, uh, quests uh, and NPC dialogue and things like that um, and carrying objects between rooms and that sort of thing uh, but it's something I think personally is best handled on a case-by-case -case basis and I would resist the urge to go I don't even know where the setting is is how <laughs> infrequently I use it uh, yeah, it's down here. So I would avoid the temptation if I were you to go in and tick this persistent box on our village. I think that would, I think that works at the moment. Like if I just tick our village and I come in here, um, do that. Oh, ooh. oh God, I don't know what's happened there. Why? Um, Okay, that's done all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> and this is why I would avoid it. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's got on there. It's moved, I think it's moved that uh, um, object somewhere else. And the, I don't even know what happened. But I mean, that's a perfectly good demonstration. Like, it's kind of a black box. Um, and what's meant by a black box is that um, you, are, you can only really ever understand what it does at a very surface high level. Um, and how exactly it functions under the hood is hidden from you, and especially in terms of what happens when and in what order. And all you can really know about it is whatever the documentation tells you about it, which is obviously going to be somewhat limited, okay? Um, so I would really avoid this option. Um, I, I honestly thought it would, would uh, work there, but I, I, I've not tested it, I've not tried it. 
Um, it's something I tend to avoid, room persistence. But in theory, in theory, I, I don't know what exactly went wrong, but in theory you can do that and it will like keep things between rooms, but um, as you can see, as I've accidentally kind of demonstrated, um, it can lead to a lot of problems. So I would avoid the temptation to try and use this and I would wait until, um, I, I basically just, you know, um, deal with persistence on a case-by-case -case basis on the things you want to r remain persistent. It's possible to get all these plants and stuff like staying cut if you really wanted them to, um, but as I said, um, pick your battles because the more things that you want to apply that to, the more complicated it's going to get. All right, okay, I'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching. See ya. Thank you, of course, and as always to my amazing Patreon supporters without whom I couldn't be doing any of this work. A huge shout out in particular and in no particular order to the following cool kids. Bowser the Dog, Zinan May, Robert Churches, Roven Darlin, Zephyr Flame, Daka Dondago, Max M, Bertie T, Relentless Rex, Do What Doobie, Jason, Dark Rider 0318, James Siggins, James L. Anderson, Hare, Hyungjin, Rupinda, Rene Dam, Scott Matthews, Leo, Tyler Hubble, Maria Celeste Oliveira Freiling, Joram Pater, Cabbage Pants, Gilberto Cisneros, Figgy, Mark Burgess, John Harwood, Zach Collett, Goose, Cal Franklin, Troy Mera, Alex Schenkel, Wilfredo Landera, Carter Green, Justin Adega, Julian Paul, and Keza Ho. Thank you all ever so much, and thank you, of course, for watching. Catch you all next time.